Hi. Uh, this may look like, like it's a regular standalone presentation by me. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney, uh, elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, seen me before, Myrick O'Connell is a firm of 60 lawyers. Uh, 40 of us are in Worcester and uh, 20 in Westboro. I do nothing but elder law. Other people do other things. Usually, um, when I do presentations at the Senior Center, at the Ashland Senior Center, the folks here at Ashland Cable are kind enough to come down and film those shows. We talked about the fact, though, that sometimes the production quality on those isn't great, so today we are trying an experiment. Uh, I did a presentation recently at the Senior Center on this issue, uh, which I called Trust 101, and if this is being filmed correctly, you're actually seeing that right now, right there, um, to my uh, left. And we're going to try filming that here to see if the, the quality is better and if you like it better. So uh, it, what I'd like you to do, by the way, if you think this presentation, if you feel strongly about the fact that this is either better or worse than filming at the Senior Center, I'd suggest call the Senior Center and let them know that, or call the folks here at the cable station and let them know, and then we'll change it. So we're going to try some different formats over the next few months. So this is a presentation, and I've called it Trust 101. Um, do you need a trust? And by the way, so I'm, I'm handling all these slides this time right from my um, laptop right here uh, that you're seeing. So this, this presentation uh, is about my friends Frank and Mary and their, and their children Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. You've all seen them before. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to answer, hopefully, a question that I get all the time. I regularly get clients who come in and one of the first questions they will ask me is, do I need a trust? Or they'll say, I think I need a trust. And I'll say, well, why is that? They'll say, well, my neighbor has one, and they told me that I need one. Or one of my kids called and said, Ma, you really need a trust. Or Ma and Dad, you really need a trust. So my answer to that question is always, so it depends on what your problem is, because trusts are one way of solving uh, various kinds of problems. So before I start going, so we're going to use examples using Frank and Mary uh, and putting them in different situations in different wealth levels and at different ages to talk about situations in which they may want to consider a trust. Uh, but first I want to do a couple of definitions. Um, inevitably I am asked about a revocable versus an irrevocable trust. What is the difference? And is that even pronounced right? Isn't it revocable and irrevocable? So first of all, um, the two pronunciations, if you go to the dictionary, are actually both valid. I'm going to call them uh, revocable and irrevocable because that's the way the most clients say them when they come in. So uh, to, 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 to give you a sense of, what the, of the point of these trusts or of a trust in general, I'm going to give you an example. Suppose that I wanted to give you $1,000. Uh, one way that I could do that is I could simply get the money and I could hand it to you. And as long as you took it from me, and as long as I intended that it be a gift and not a loan, uh, then my giving that money to you, and you're accepting it, my giving it to you with donative intent, with the intent to give it to you, and you're accepting it would constitute legally a completed gift. Uh, and the reason why that's of significance is that if it was a completed gift, then tomorrow if I called you and said, I want my money back, you wouldn't have to give it to me because you would have become the owner of the money the moment that that gift was completed. So um, another alternative if I wanted to give you money or if I wanted to give my children money or my grandchildren, but I might be nervous about the way in which they were going to handle it, is that I might get a third party uh, and I might hand the money to them and, and, and say, you hold that money for them. I'm going to give this money to my children and I'm going to say, hold that money for your, your children, for my grandchildren. Hold it in trust for them. Uh, and I might even set up a set of instructions for that money or I might do, it, do this with a house. I might transfer anything that I would have made as a gift. Instead, I might give it to a trustee to hold in trust. A trustee is simply a person who is holding property. He's the legal owner of the property, but he's holding it for the benefit of certain other people called beneficiaries. So uh, that's the way in which I would create a trust. Now if I um, um, gave that property to a trustee, even if I wrote some trust terms down regarding how the trust was supposed to work, unless I said that that trust was irrevocable, 
uh, I would have the right at any time to take that property back, to call the trustee and say, I don't want that money to be in trust anymore. Give it back to me. I'm revoking the trust, at which point the trustee would be legally obligated to give the money back to me uh, and not to give it to the beneficiaries. Um, it, it, many people refer to this, this kind of trust, to a revocable trust, um, when they're talking about planning in order to protect their assets um, in the event that they need nursing home care. They have heard, many people have heard, that if property has been transferred either to a third party, given to their children, or transferred to an irrevocable trust, and that that property has been in there for at least five years, uh, that that property is then safe. An irrevocable trust is a trust, as the name implies, which cannot be revoked, so that once I put assets into this trust, I no longer have the ability to revoke the trust and simply take the assets back. For mass health purposes though, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, another crucial part of that trust is not whether, simply whether it is irrevocable, but whether, whether it is unamendable. Whether I have any way by amending that, the, the trust document, to cause myself to be a beneficiary and have, have the assets coming back to me. If I do, even if I've transferred the assets to an irrevocable trust, those assets are still mine for mass health purposes if I want to try to qualify for mass health. So the trust uh, in that case has to be irrevocable and unamendable. I'm going to be using those terms a lot later on, so I wanted to give you a sense of them. One more distinction, and that is between testamentary and non-testamentary trust. A testamentary trust is a trust that is actually part of my will. Suppose that I decide through my will that instead of leaving assets to my child who may have some financial problems, who may have some spousal problems, or to my grandchildren who are very young, I may decide that instead I'm going to leave those assets to somebody as a trustee for their benefit or for their children's benefit. Maybe I'll leave the assets to the children as trustees for their grandchildren's benefit. If the trust is part of the will, it's actually written as part of the will, then that trust is called a testamentary trust. If it's not a testamentary trust, if it's any, any other kind, if it's a trust that was not created through a will, then it is called an inter vivos trust, inter vivo be, meaning between living people. So if there are either testamentary trusts or non-testamentary trusts, and either one of them can be either revocable or irrevocable, although of course if you have a, a, a trust that is part of your will, um, then you can revoke it at any time before you die because you can always change your will. So in that way you could think of those trusts as being revocable until you die and then irrevocable after you die. So with those distinctions in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, you may have seen me do presentations and you've heard me say their goal in life, they have three children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. Um, their basic estate plan is that if one of them dies, all things being equal, they'd like to leave everything to the other. If the two of them have died, they'd like to have all assets divided among their three children. Liquidated, that means turned into money and the proceeds divided among their three children. That's kind of their basic estate plan. That's part one. But kind of um, within that estate plan, is kind of it is implied that there are a set of people that they'd rather not give the money to. I have yet to find a client who said, I really want to include the IRS or the State Department of Revenue in my will. I think they deserve a little extra money. Or that I really want to endow the nursing home. Or that I want to give money to MassHealth, the entity that administers um, the Medicaid program here in Massachusetts. So oftentimes, my estate planning uh, is, is, is about making sure that the assets go, with, go to the people that Frank and Mary want them to go to and don't go to the people that Frank and Mary don't want them to go to. So with that all in mind, let's take the first example. Here's Frank and Mary, um, and, they ha they ha and they're 65 years old. They own a home jointly. Uh, they, Frank has an IRA, um, and he's named his wife uh, Mary as the beneficiary. Um, um, Frank also has an annuity in which he is named as the annuitant, that is, the person to whom payments get made while he is alive. Mary is named as the beneficiary. As I actually mentioned at the seminar, it's always bizarre to me that when you create an annuity and you're getting payments from that annuity, you're not called the beneficiary. In this case, you're actually called the annuitant 
The person that receives those payments after you die is typically referred to as the death beneficiary. So finally, Frank and Mary have some other savings which they hold jointly with uh, rights of survivorship. That is their basic, that is Frank and Mary and that is their basic set of assets. So um, if Frank and Mary are 65 when they come in, they may be not talking about trying to um, shield some of these assets against the possibility that they may need nursing home care. The reason for that is that only, uh, if you're 65 years old, there is only a one in nine chance that you are, you are going to get Alzheimer's, which is the major cause of dementia, dementia being that whole set of symptoms around the fact that you lose your memory and you lose control of things because you've lost your memory. Um, and dementia, folks with dementia are by far the largest number of occupants in nursing homes. So if Frank and Mary are still young, they may decide since their chances are only one in nine that they're going to get Alzheimer's before they die, that they don't need to plan for that, at least not at this point. If Frank and Mary were older, and I've given you this example, if Frank and Mary were age 85, their chances are going to be one in three that they will end up with Alzheimer's before they die and therefore have some significant chance of ending up in a nursing home. So at this point, Frank and Mary are not planning around uh, trying to protect their assets uh, regarding nursing home issues. Um, similarly, if Frank and Mary's assets are below a million dollars, which they are in this case, then Frank and Mary don't need to think about protecting their assets for estate tax avoidance purposes. The reason for that is that the, the minimum size of, of an estate that for federal purposes is subject to estate tax is over $5.4 million. The minimum size that is even subject to Massachusetts estate tax is a million dollars. So if Frank and Mary have assets that are worth less than a million dollars, they simply don't have to worry about planning uh, to deal with estate tax avoidance unless, of course, their assets are really close to a million dollars, they're really worried that the assets might grow to be more than a million dollars, in which case they may want to do some of that planning. But in this case, we're going to assume that that's not their issue. So what, what then are they trying to plan for? Well, very commonly, they are trying to plan to avoid probate. Uh, to understand why somebody would want to avoid probate, although there's just a general feeling that you should, people kind of know that, you need to understand kind of what probate is, what the point of probate is. So if you die owning an asset and that asset is just in your name at the time that you die, it's not owned jointly with somebody else, there's no bank account that has a pay on death clause to it, which means that you're really holding it as the trustee in that case. Um, if you just own an asset in your name, say your house or your car, and you die, then probe, the, somebody has to figure out who owns the property after you die. And the probate court is the entity that is designated as the, as the court that is, that is designed to make those kinds of decisions. So if you're Frank and Mary, uh, once again, going back to their, uh, their basic asset situation, you know, Frank and Mary own a house jointly with rights of survivorship, uh, what that means, and by the way, they also own their savings account jointly. What joint ownership means, as opposed to individual ownership, is that all of the joint owners of something all own technically 100% of that thing, whether it is money in the bank or a house or whatever. Um, and what that means is that if, if one of them dies, if a joint owner dies, that person's interest in that property simply evaporates uh, leaving the other person or persons as the sole owners of that property. So in this case, uh, if Frank died um, leaving these ba joint bank accounts and the savings accounts, Mary would become the sole owner of those accounts immediately without probate. Frank's IRA, while it looks like Frank owns that asset, actually he doesn't. When he gets that bank statement from the bank or from Fidelity or whoever every month saying how his asset is doing, it's, it's, it's typically going to say uh, so-and-so custodian for uh, Frank. And the reason for that is that technically the bank is the owner of that money, but the bank has certain responsibilities to pay Frank that money on certain, um, in certain situations. So one of the pieces of that kind of ownership is that Frank has the, has the right to name a death beneficiary for that money, just as he could with a life insurance policy, and actually just as he can with this annuity typically, uh, he can name a death beneficiary following his death, 
which means as long as he's named a death beneficiary, when he dies, that asset goes to the death beneficiary. Only if he's failed to name someone or if that person has died before him would the asset have to go through his estate. So in this case, if Frank were to die, um, his, none of his assets would have to go through probate. Uh, if anything did need to go through probate, and I'm just going to check to see what is next. Yeah, so if Frank dies, um, uh, nothing has to go through probate. Uh, if, if Mary, though, owns these same assets, um, and then Mary dies, well then, uh, there are two assets um, that, uh, that need to go through probate. Mary, at this point, is the sole owner of the, of the home, and she's the sole owner of all of those savings. And so the probate process needs to be there in order to figure out who becomes the owner of those things. Now, there are a couple of things about the probate process that a lot of folks don't like. One, it takes time to get through probate. Why is that? Well, the main reason is that the probate court really has a couple of jobs uh, if you die owning something and it needs to go through probate. One is to figure out who owns the asset, and as we just discussed, uh, that would be figured out by the probate court. If you had a will, then the people who become the owners would be the people named in your will. Uh, if you didn't have a will, then the owner uh, would be people who are designated um, through a state law, which basically creates a will for you. They're called the rules of intestacy. So in all cases, if you die owning something, uh, there is a system to figure out who becomes the owner. The, the problem, though, is that those assets can't be distributed to those new owners for a year following the date of your death. And the reason that is that the probate court also has a responsibility to make sure that all creditors get paid. And any creditor of yours at the moment of your death uh, has one year from the date of your death to file a claim against your estate. Now, that seems like a long time. Actually, that, 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 that one year is actually off, often referred to as a short statute of limitations. Uh, I'll, the reason why it's considered short, if I were to get into a car accident with you today and run over you, not kill you, but just run over you, you would have um, three years from the day that I did that to sue me in order to get reparations, to, to, to get me to pay you something or my insurance company to pay you something to compensate you for your injuries. Uh, if, on the other hand, I were to run over you and then hit a stone wall and die, um, you would only have one year from the date of my death to sue my estate, which will contain all of the assets that I owned at the time of my death, um, in, in order to try to collect money. But by, by the way, um, if I have structured my assets so that nothing goes through probate, it may very well be that even though I ran over you, when I die, you won't be able to get anything from any of the assets that I owned when I die. So in any event, um, from your perspective, as the person who wants to sue me, that statute of limitations is a short statute of limitations. From the perspective of my kids, though, uh, or, who anybody, or anybody who might be expecting to receive something as a result of my death, that's a really long statute of limitations. That means that nothing can happen, no assets can be distributed, basically, for a year following my death until it is assured that there are no creditors. So many people will try to structure things in order to avoid that. The second reason why they'll try to do that is money. They, they know that they've heard, and it's true, that going through the probate process is uh, uh, difficult, for a layman to do. So typically they'll hire a lawyer to do, to do this work, to go back and forth to the probate court and communicate with them as necessary. Typically that's going to cost these people between five and ten thousand dollars. So folks are trying to avoid that also. So if I marry and, and, and I want to know that following my death um, my kids won't have to go through that delay and won't have to spend that kind of money, what I may want to do uh, is figure out an alternative now, there are several possible alternatives that Mary has. One, uh, she could name death beneficiaries on all of her assets. Uh, this wouldn't quite work regarding the house. She'd have to do something a little different, but she may be able to do that regarding those other bank accounts. Two, Mary could name other people as joint owners with her on these assets. She could put her kids or one, all of her kids on her deed with her, deed the property to herself and all of her kids jointly with rights of survivorship. Um, she could do the same thing with the bank account. Now once again, as I explained, if she owned that property jointly with them, then legally 
each one of them would own 100% of the assets. So if she died, her interest would simply evaporate. It wouldn't have to go through probate. That's the good news. The bad news is that these other people would actually be owners of this property, co-owners with her uh, from the time that she put them on the bank account or the deed, which meant that means that uh, if she, any one of them could go to the bank and take all of the money out and any creditor of theirs could attach the money in the bank because she owned the property jointly and therefore technically owned 100% of it. Uh, and if Mary needed to transfer the house, um, she'd need everybody to sign off. So there may be some reasons why she doesn't want to hold the property with them jointly. Uh, a second alternative um, regarding, or another alternative regarding real estate, and one that you've probably heard about, is that Frank and Mary could convey their property, or Mary could convey a so-called remainder interest in her property to her kids and keep a life estate. What does that mean? It means that as long as she's alive, she would have the right to total control of the property. She'd be able to throw anybody out that she wanted and nobody could throw her out of her house. She'd continue to be responsible for the bills, for the real estate taxes and the insurance and all the other bills. Um, she'd want to keep insurance because if somebody fell and hurt themselves on the property, she could get sued. Um, but following her death, her life estate, her interest in the property, would evaporate, leaving the kids as the sole owners. Um, this is often used uh, by single people as a way to deal with the real estate, and it's certainly the least expensive as a legal matter. Um, the, there are two problems with it, and I'll just mention those problems. One, um, actually there are three. One, that if she transfers an interest to these kids as remainder interest and keeps a life estate in the property, and she ends up having to sell the property or decides she wants to sell the property before she dies, <clears throat> even if everybody's willing to cooperate, as a result of the fact that the kids own the remainder interest, unless they're living there, they're going to pay a capital gains tax regarding any capital gain on the property. Without going into detail on this, Mary, because she's an owner-occupant, as long as she's lived there for two of the last five years, is able to get a very large home ownership capital gains exemption. Uh, if she only owned a life estate, this exemption would only apply to her life estate. So that's a problem. Problem number two was illustrated for me recently when uh, I got a call from a woman who had wanted to protect her house um, if for mass health purposes. She wanted to get this remainder interest out of her name. Um, and so she transferred that interest to her one son. She kept a life estate. But then she called me and asked me to stop by because she told me that her son had recently been served with divorce papers by her, his wife. She wanted to know if there was a problem. My answer to her, oh yes, that's a big problem. That's a big problem because her son, the owner of the remainder interest in the property, actually had something that was in play, whether for attachment by creditors or for attachment by someone filing for divorce, suddenly his remainder interest, which in this case, because she was pretty old, ended up being equal to about 80% of the value of the property, was going to end up subject to that divorce. The third example that I've often given is I know some folks um, uh, that live on Martha's Vineyard who the parents had moved to Martha's Vineyard a number of years ago or had bought a, a home there, a vacation home, and eventually moved there. And when they moved there, they uh, conveyed this remainder interest to their, their three children, if I recall correctly, um, but kept a life estate in the property. Uh, and five years following that transfer, the transfer had been done maybe 10 or 15 years ago, um, that th therefore, that property was safe, the remainder interest was safe if these folks needed to qualify for mass health. The problem was, though, that at this point, they were in their 80s, they weren't trying to qualify for mass health. They just wanted to sell their house and move back to their old neighborhood. And they called their kids, and all but one of them was happy to deed their, that child's interest back to, by the way, every once in a while that's going to happen by mistake, because I haven't nailed this down. Um, they were willing to deed this interest back to the, the parents, but one of them wasn't. And so the parents said, so what can I do? Or what can we do? And the answer was nothing. Um, they, all of the children had to cooperate in transferring the property back to the parents. Otherwise, they were stuck. They weren't going to be able to sell their house. Um, so there were reasons why these other mechanisms have like pluses and minuses. A final option would be for Mary to take the property, 
create a revocable and amendable trust, a trust that she could revoke and therefore get the property back anytime, a trust that was amendable so that she could change the rules anytime, make herself the trustee of that trust, and deed herself as trustee the property so that she became the owner as trustee. She would also specify, though, that following her death, uh, one of her kids, or more of her kids if she wanted to, could be named as the successor trustees. They would then, upon her death, be able to turn around, sell, liquidate the property, and distribute the, the funds to all the kids, which was exactly what Mary had in mind in her estate plan. So in that situation, um, Mary may decide that it would be wise for her to create a revocable or an amendable trust, I just violated my own rule, a revocable and amendable trust, deed the property to herself, and thereby avoid probate following her death. So that's the situation where a revocable and amendable trust may make perfect sense. Um, now we're just going. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the the estate tax avoidance and how a trust might fit in there. So we're going to take the same example with Frank and Mary, but now notice their assets values have gone up. Their house went up to four hundred thousand in value. Their savings went up to five fifty. So their total assets are now a million two hundred thousand dollars, over a million dollars. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier. If Frank were to die, while well, if Frank were to die in that case, leaving all those assets to Mary, there would be no estate tax. There was a 100% marital deduction. However, uh, if Mary then, with those assets, dies, there will be an estate tax. Uh, the estate tax on a taxable estate of $1.2 million is $49,040. Remember, the estate tax on a taxable estate of a million or less is zero. So effectively, she's paying $49,000 on that last $200,000 uh, that put her over that million dollars. So the question is, is there a mechanism, which there is, um, for Frank and Mary to avoid uh, their having to pay that estate tax after they have died, thereby shrinking the assets that are going to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr.? And the answer is yes. Um, once again, assuming those assets, they could both create what I'll call, for want of a better term, a tax avoidance trust. How does that work? The trust, is, the trust would be very straightforward. Frank, for example, would put uh, a provision in his will or would create a standalone trust and fund that trust before his death. And he would specify in that, e either in the testamentary trust as part of his will or in this standalone inter vivos trust, um, that following his death, not more than $1 million of his assets would either stay in trust or go into trust for the benefit of his spouse and his children, of his spouse and his children. Now Mary, even though she was still alive, could still could be the trustee of that trust. And Mary could have the power as the trustee of that trust to actually distribute those assets to herself. So that as a practical matter, Frank hasn't really put Mary in a box or limited her financial options by structuring things this way because Mary can be the trustee. For tax purposes, though, if things are structured this way, once again, that, those are the, uh, those are the uh, assets that they have. Remember, the, the house is worth $400,000. If Frank, say, were to put the house into trust, or, or say as part of his will, if he make, and make sure that he owned the property at his death, that the house was going to go into this trust, at Frank's death, he would have a taxable estate of $400,000. Because he didn't leave everything to Mary, he would have some taxable estate, $400,000. But because that's less than a million dollars, that taxable estate would not be taxed because it's less than a million. Mary then would inherit $800,000, everything else. Upon Mary's death, Mary's estate would now be under a million also. Her estate would only have $800,000 in it. So there would be no tax there. So as a practical matter, by structuring things this way, using a tax avoidance trust, Frank and Mary would have avoided the estate tax if Frank died first. What about if Mary died first? Well, say that Mary, prior to her death, had taken all of the bank accounts, remember in this example she had a total of $550,000, and put them in just her name, or held them in trust, a trust which would be revocable and amendable until she died. Following her death, though, those funds would go in trust for Frank's benefit. Remember, Frank can be the trustee of that trust, and Frank can use the money 
but the money would be in trust. Therefore, at Mary's death, she would end up with a taxable estate of $550,000, which is below a million and not taxable. When Frank dies, his estate would be worth the rest, the other $650,000, which also would not be taxable because it's below a million, and therefore they would have avoided the estate tax. So a, a trust in this case, one which is either part of the will or which is created before Frank and Mary died and which remains revocable and amendable before Frank and Mary die, but become irrevocable upon their deaths, that trust could help them in this situation completely avoid the estate tax, the Massachusetts estate tax. So now we're going to use a third example. Uh, and this is the example that probably is the one that m my, most of my clients are concerned about. Frank and Mary are now older, they're 85. They own the same old assets as they had originally. They only have $800,000 in assets, which is, I shouldn't say only, that's not nothing. That's really quite something that Frank and Mary during their lifetimes managed to raise their kids and still save that amount of money and have a house that's not subject to a mortgage. So say they're 85 though and now they really are worried uh, that, about this possibility that one of them may need uh, nursing home care at some point in the future. Maybe they're coming in because one of them is already starting to have a memory that seems to be kind of fading and people are getting nervous that perhaps dementia is being seen, and re remember dementia, parenthetically, dementia and Alzheimer's are not the same thing. Dementia is simply a set of symptoms, all basically clustered around losing your memory. Alzheimer's is the primary cause of that particular set of symptoms. Alzheimer's is a disease, dementia is a set of symptoms. So in this situation, perhaps Mary is starting to be, get kind of forgetful and Frank and Mary are both kind of nervous and they're, and they're saying, can, is there anything we can do to protect our assets? And the answer is actually, yes, there is. But to understand this, you really need to understand a little bit more about MassHealth. Now, MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Uh, Medicaid is health insurance basically for the poor, as opposed to Medicare, which is health insurance for the old. Uh, most of my clients have Medicare. My, my median client age is uh, 74 years old. Um, um, they, they don't have Medicaid necessarily. The way you qualify for Medicaid is by demonstrating that you have less than $2,000 in countable assets. And of course, Frank and Mary have a lot more than that. Um, but the, but the, the, the key to understanding uh, Frank and Mary's estate planning options now is to understand that if Mary goes into the nursing home and they, and they are both still alive, while Mary's asset limit is $2,000, and by the way, if she still owned the home, she, she could still own the home, but it, even if she qualified for MassHealth, but MassHealth would at that point put a lien on it in order to recover whatever was paid on her behalf after her death. But the bottom line is, the, the point is that if both of them are alive, but Mary goes to the nursing home, then Frank, as the spouse at home, can really have substantial assets. He can own the home itself, as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. Uh, he can have cash or cash equivalent assets of $119,220 or less. And he can have unlimited income. Now, you're looking at these numbers saying, but yeah, Frank and Mary had more than this amount of assets. But the key is the unlimited income. So what, what Frank and Mary can do the day that Mary goes into the nursing home. Um, if Frank comes in to me and says, oh my God, is there anything we can do? I'd say yes. Uh, what you want to do is you want to have Mary transfer all of her assets to you, Frank. Then we want to have Frank buy an annuity. What is an annuity? An annuity is a contract, typically with an insurance company, whereby you pay them some money, and in return, they agree to pay you some money back. Um, in this case, you would want to buy an annuity Frank would want to buy an annuity that called for equal monthly payments over a term that does not exceed his actuarial life expectancy. If Frank buys that annuity, if Frank buys that annuity, no matter how much he buys it for, the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset. And remember, in this case, Frank is over asset because he can only have $119,220 and a non-countable income stream. Remember, Frank can have infinite income. So in this situation, where Frank and Mary are both alive, if, Frank, or if Mary needs nursing home care, 
Mary can qualify for mass health fairly quickly. And by the way, I just noted that the, the length of the annuity, uh, if Frank is 85, would need to be shorter than 5.84 years, which in this case would be Frank's actuarial life expectancy. So the problem, though, is what if Frank has died and Mary has inherited all of these assets? So when, when I'm going to step back for a second. So remember, um, in this situation, Mary can be completely safe. Uh, Frank is probably going to want to do one other, one other thing, though, because if Frank, if Frank dies, Frank doesn't want to be leaving all of his assets to Mary because if he does, Mary's no longer going to be eligible for mass health. She's going to have too much. So what Frank should do to prepare for that, in case Mary ends up in a nursing home, um, is Frank should, should change his will so as to specify that upon his death, any of his assets, and this would be any of the assets that have been transferred to him, and they can be transferred to him any time before his death, instead of going directly to Mary, would go into a, 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 a testamentary trust, a so-called asset protection trust. It would be a trust that is part of his will. He could name one or all of his kids as the trustees of this trust. He could name anybody else for that matter. He could specify that the funds and trust could be used, could be given back to Mary at any time, or could be used to supplement her care at any time. But as long as these assets were owned by Frank before his death, and therefore all flowed into this testamentary trust, those assets upon his death would be safe in the event that Mary needed to qualify for mass health, which is just crucial. So in other words, while Frank and Mary are both alive, they don't need to um, transfer their assets out to an irrevocable trust or an irrevocable trust and wait five years. Remember, that's one of the things that I talked about right at the beginning of this presentation. So often people tell me, they come in, and they're concerned because they, they, they want to make sure their assets are protected if they need nursing home care. But they're really nervous about losing control of their assets. There's, you know, they're married, they're happy, they don't know that anyone's going to go into a nursing home. And I'll tell them, in that situation, you really don't need to lose control of your assets. You can keep them. Just change your wills so as to make sure that if one of you dies, the other spouse is going to be safe. So in that case, a, a, creating a testamentary trust, a trust that is part of your will, which is therefore revocable or revocable at any time prior to your death because you can change your will any time prior to your death, but which says that upon your death, assets are going to get held for your spouse is a way that Frank and Mary can avoid um, this the, or can, can uh, deal with protecting each other if one of them dies while at the same time keeping control of their assets. Which leads to the, re to the remaining problem though. What if Frank and Mary hadn't done that and Frank has died? In that, and Mary comes in, and this happens to me fairly regularly, that uh, a spouse has died and the, uh, the, the surviving spouse will come in often with their kids and say, they're nervous now, they want to make sure their assets are safe in the event that the surviving spouse goes into the nursing home. At that point, Mary really only has one option, or two options. Uh, they're both the same though. She has one option. She needs to transfer her assets away to the extent that she wants to protect them, and she needs to wait five years. Now, there are a couple alternatives for Mary in this case. She could simply transfer the assets to her kids uh, and wait five years. Or she could transfer, in the case of her house, a remainder interest to her kids and keep a, a, a life estate. We talked about that a little bit. But there are disadvantages to that. A second alternative is that she may want to create a trust now, which is an irrevocable trust. That is a trust that she cannot revoke an unamendable trust, unamendable by her, so that she cannot change it in a way to give herself back the assets. She can then transfer assets into that irrevocable trust. She may want to transfer the remainder interest of the house into that trust. She may want to transfer some of her cash into that trust. If she does that and waits five years, then following at the, on the first day following the fifth anniversary of that transfer, whatever's in trust, is going to be safe. If she later transfers additional assets into that trust, they will be safe five years from the date on which, on that later date on which those, later, those assets were later transferred. So in that situation, there may be a reason for Mary now, or for a single person, to create an irrevocable trust and to transfer assets into them. 
There are two other situations where this irrevocable trust mechanism may be appropriate. One, if you have a vacation home. Uh, in that situation, in the event that one of the two of you goes to a nursing home, and if you're both alive and one of you goes to a nursing home, and the, and, the, and the plan is to transfer all assets to the spouse at home and then have that asset, that, that um, spouse buy an annuity, the problem is going to be that to do that, you're going to have to sell that vacation home, and you may not want to do that. So in that case, if you're trying to plan ahead, you may want to transfer the vacation home into an irrevocable trust and wait the five years. Uh, a second reason for doing it is if you're worried about the possibility that you both may end up in the nursing home at the same time. Because the asset transfer uh, rules that we were just talking about, having one spouse who's in the nursing home transfer the assets to the other spouse who then does some things, wouldn't be available if both spouses go into the nursing home at the same time. Um, occasionally, I have found folks who are very nervous about this and therefore will transfer assets to an irrevocable trust, knowing that five years after they've done that, they are protected in that situation. I would just suggest that in my experience, and I have been practicing law now, uh, it will be 40 years in January, in my experience, uh, that, occur that has only occurred twice, that I have seen spouses both in the nursing home. In both cases, they were both in their 90s. In neither case did either spouse live very long in the nursing home. Uh, but if you're concerned about it, there is an alternative. So the bottom line here is that, that if Frank and Mary are both alive, then one can protect the other by simply uh, changing their wills to create these testamentary trusts. Now I'm going to deal with one other issue. Remember, if Frank did something like that, right, um, and actually created a, te and, and actually specified through his will that all the assets that he had in trust were going to be uh, um, uh, in a trust for the benefit of his wife, um, and he then put his house in trust, in, in, into his name, then following his death, the house would, would pass through this te testamentary trust and be safe from Mary's benefit. Remember, this is the old example from when, from when Frank and Mary had a million two in countable assets. Remember, though, that in that example, all of the other assets were simply going to go to Mary, the other 800,000 in assets. The problem with this, if Mary needs nursing home care, is that that $800,000 would have to be spent down. So the question is, is there a way that Frank and Mary can structure things so that A, if one of them dies, the other will be safe as far as the nursing home is concerned, and B, so that once the two of them have died, there will be no estate tax? And the answer to that is yes, you can actually do both. Um, there are a few things that would have to change, however. Uh, first, in that case, if Frank died, Mary could not be the trustee of the trust holding the $800,000. Because, as we discussed earlier, if Mary has control of that money, then as far as Mass Health is concerned, she should be spending it on the nursing home. Um, B, um, in that case, so, so in that case, the, ch the, the other children should probably be the trustees. And in that case, there should probably be a trust holding that other $800,000. And the kids should be the, trustee of that, to the trustees of that trust. So in this situation, Frank and Mary could, by creating two trusts, um, each of them, uh, one a, a, what we'll call a tax avoidance trust a, or a credit shelter trust and the other a marital trust, structure things so that they are not only protecting each other in the event that one dies and the other needs nursing home care, but that they're also structuring things so as to eliminate the estate tax that eventually would have been paid by their children. So, to summarize, when folks come in to me and say, do I need a trust or don't I need a trust? My answer is always, so what's the problem? What is your estate plan? How old are you? What are your assets? What are your goals? And then you can figure that out. There are three basic reasons to do um, trusts. One is for probate avoidance purposes. One is for estate tax minimization purposes. One is for asset protection for nursing home purposes. Any of these are valid purposes. You may be able to do more than one at the same time. You can't do all three at the same time. So the kind of trust that you develop or whether you need one in the first place really is a function of what your individual situation is. So I appreciate your watching today. If you want to watch this show again, you can um, uh, download it here from, uh, from Ashland 
cable TV. You can find uh, all of the presentations that I've done on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, and uh, here is the information regarding reaching that channel. As you know from my many presentations, the goal of all of my work is to help you sleep well at night. Um, as I say to people, at, at our age, fame and fortune are not the goal of life anymore. It's just trying to get a good night's sleep. Hopefully, uh, this presentation has helped you think out some of these issues. Um, if, if you are, have got an interest in any of these, you should really talk to an elder law attorney about them. Thank you, and uh, if you've enjoyed this presentation in this format, you may see it again in the future. Otherwise, we may be back to doing things from the Ashland Council on Aging. Thank you for watching.